Bill Havens dreamed of going to the Olympic Games in Paris on the canoe team. He worked for it, planned for it, dreamed about it. The announcement finally came. He was selected to go. But during the same week as the Olympics, his first child was due, and in 1924 there were no jets to speed travelers across the ocean. He made his decision. He would stay home with his wife, a happy once-in-a-lifetime occasion to have a firstborn. But there was also a crushed dream, to miss his only opportunity to go to the Olympics. One would say his dream did not come true. But it was in July 1952 that the telegram arrived from the Olympics in Helsinki, Finland. The telegram read, Congratulations, Dad, I won. I'm bringing home the gold medal you lost while waiting for me to be born. Our major dreams can come true. Not always in the way we originally envision them. Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderburg. Have you ever thought about how you spend your time each day? Today, for instance, did you devote more time to things or to people? If your life is filled with meetings and deadlines or diapers and dishes, do you still make sure there's time to read the four-year-old a story, to answer the questions? Time goes so quickly. Soon she'll be grown and gone, and the things to do will still be there. Do you have teenagers? I recently asked a 13-year-old if she could talk to her mother. I'll never forget her reply. She said, she listens, but she doesn't hear. She's always busy doing something. At the end of the day, has the report been finished, the house cleaned, but the wife or the husband or the child told, I'll listen later. Was there little time to stop, look, listen? If we don't plan time to read the story, to listen to a problem, to visit someone elderly. Somehow, at the end of too many days, will we ask, where did the time go for the people? One. Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderburg. Could you name at least one way in which all people everywhere in the world are completely equal? We all have 24 hours to live each day. The richest man in the world cannot buy more time. Most people work eight hours and sleep eight hours. That leaves eight hours. How do you spend those third eight hours? Are you a spectator of life? Do you spend your free time watching others on television or playing football or basketball? Is there something you've always wanted to do, but there's never been time? Study, write, exercise. If you started one hour earlier in the morning, you could probably fulfill this desire. My father-in-law plays nine holes of golf in the morning and is home by seven. We use this hour to jog. Many businessmen use this time to plan their day. Eight hours to work, eight hours to sleep. How do you spend your third eight hours? Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderburg. I recently asked a 24-year-old friend of mine to go skiing with us in Colorado, and she said, I don't know how to ski. I wish I'd learned when I was young. Are you allowing age to influence your life? If Winston Churchill had died in his 60s, he would have been one of the great failures in British politics. He was 65 when he finally came into power, the age many Americans are beginning to quit. Articles don't talk about his genius or his talent. They talk about the lisp that he had, that he was never really able to overcome. They talk about his constant study of the English language. When he was 65, 70, 75, 80, 85 years old, he would write and rewrite every major speech. And then he'd go up into his room all alone, and he'd practice out loud by the hour. Winston Churchill's most important dynamic years were between 65 and 85. What are you planning to do during those years? Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderburg. The Impossible Dream has always been one of my favorite songs. Have you ever had an impossible dream? 
Karoy Takic did. He was favored to win in the 1948 Olympics. He excelled in an exacting sport, one demanding precision and coordination, pistol marksmanship. In 1946, he won the Hungarian National Championship and became even more determined and optimistic. But late in 1946, driving down a dark Budapest street, a car hit him head on and he was trapped in the mangled wreckage. When he awoke, he found that his right arm, the arm that he had trained to perfection, had been amputated. His life was shattered and he sank into a deep depression. But who could forget, only two years later, at the 1948 Olympics, standing on the winner's platform holding the gold medal, a man who had against impossible odds, trained his left arm and his left aiming eye. Karoy Takic, a one-armed champion of the world. Have you ever had an impossible dream? Do you have any dream at all? Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderber. Have you ever known a man who was suddenly severely injured or physically handicapped? You probably thought, what a tragedy that a life that could have been filled with challenge and accomplishment was devastated by a physical handicap. I'd like to give you several clues to a man's identity and see if you know his name. Can you tell me who this man was? A former governor of New York, the only man to serve as president of the United States four times, a dynamic speaker. When I asked three young teenagers what they could tell me about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, they could only remember that he had been president during World War II. The first memories that come to mind seldom include the fact that he had polio at age 39 and as president of the United States sat in a wheelchair. In fact, many people who knew him would forget completely that he was paralyzed. Once when Madame Chiang Kai-shek came into President Roosevelt's office, she said, Please don't stand, Mr. President. And he said, You compliment me. Is it the handicap that shapes our lives or how we react to the handicap? Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderber. If your child were given a multiple choice form and asked to check which words best describe you, which words do you think he might choose? Understanding, constantly nagging, Someone to confide in? Too busy to listen? In his book, Kids Say the Darndest Things, Art Linkletter relates some of the answers he received when he asked young children this question. How would I know your mother if I met her? My mother's sort of fat and wears a torn green dress. My mother has dark brown hair, glasses, and a lot of safety pins where you can't see them. When I asked a little boy how he would describe his mother, he said she wakes up happy. She's fun to be with. If your child were asked to describe you, what would he say? What will his memories be? Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderber. If you were facing a serious operation, would you be more confident having a young surgeon or an older surgeon? Many people would consider the older person more qualified, but this isn't always true. When the president of a company was nearing retirement, he had to choose one of two men to succeed him, a man who had been with the company for 20 years and a man who had been there only six years. The older man knew he'd get the promotion. He had a spring in his step he hadn't had for years. But the president called Bill, the younger man, into the office and told him he would be president. Bill was so surprised that his first remark was, but I've only been with the company for six years and John's been here for 20. The president said yes, and it's going to be difficult for me to tell him. But you've contributed more in your six years than he has in his 20. You've been creative, aggressive, learning. John hasn't grown in his job. He simply repeated one year 20 times. To continue learning and studying is a decision each of us must make. What is your decision?
Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderber. Do you know anyone elderly who lives alone? I wonder how many thousands of men and women are now living alone or in senior citizen homes. How I respect the older person who has risen above what could be a chasm of loneliness to welcome the sunlight, to enjoy the day, to take pride in herself because she knows that an older person can be one of nature's most beautiful designs. Dr. Marie Stopes once said, At 16, I was vain because someone praised me. My father said, They're only praising your youth. You can take no credit for beauty at 16. But if you're beautiful at 60, it will be your own soul's doing. Then you may be proud of it and be loved for it. A sense of humor and charm and beauty at 16 are a part of youth. If at 60 or 70 or 80, you have charm and wit and an optimistic outlook. Do you know what a joy you are to the younger generations? Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderver. Have you ever tried to lose weight? Is there anyone left in America who wouldn't answer yes to that question? Have you ever tried to break any habit? Smoking, drinking, being late? Were you successful? If you weren't, you're probably thinking you failed. Many people believe you're never a failure until you stop trying. There was a fascinating article in a business magazine several years ago. They found the 100 largest companies in America that were still being run by the men who had originally created them. And then they delved into these men's lives, and they found that these men had failed an average of seven times apiece. Now, if they had not been willing to risk failure, and indeed to fail, and most important of all, to try again, start all over, perhaps they never would have become the great entrepreneurs. You can never really be a failure unless you've given up. Stop trying. If you've lost your battle to stop smoking or drinking or your fight to lose weight, you haven't really failed if you'll try again. Begin again. Today? Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderber. If you were going to interview for a new job, what questions would you ask? What will I be paid? How many vacation days? Let me share with you the way Napoleon Hill interviewed for his first job. In essence, his letter said this, I've just graduated from school, and you'll be delighted to know that I have selected you as my employer. Now, here's the condition of my employment. I will work for six months without pay. If I haven't demonstrated beyond all question of a doubt that I have the sort of material in me that any great corporation such as yours would naturally be seeking, I will step aside. But before doing so, I will reimburse you for the cost of the supervision during the six-month trial. He got the job, became successful, because he was more concerned with what service he could give than in what he could get. Are we teaching our children that it's in giving that we receive? Do you believe it's true? In work, in marriage, the more you contribute, the more you receive.